So, hello everyone, my name is Nellis. Um, so, to give a bit of context to my talk, uh, I work as part of a project called Yorva Farm at UCL. Uh, it's a five year project looking at the spread of Neolithic in southeastern Europe using a variety of techniques from uh, zoo archaeology, archaeobotany, uh, pottery, and lithics analysis, and combining those to look at how the different cultures in that region developed and spread and how how different they were to each other, how well defined they are. Um, my part in that is to combine a lot of that data eventually into a uh, agent-based model of the spread of culture into southeastern Europe. Um, there's been a fair amount of modeling done on this already, but largely it's been looking at the speed of the Neolithic transition, how people spread in or whether whether it was cultural exchange or demography uh, spreading the Neolithic into Europe. Uh, so we have a lot of detailed models on the speed of the uh, transition, on the direction of the transition, on what is thought to locally cause that speed. Um, but what we want to look at is a much more qualitative model and look at um, the cultures themselves and the way those cultures change. So archaeological cultures are commonly defined based on um, a series of material finds, material assemblage, whether that be their style of pottery, their style of farming, their style of uh, stone tool production, etc. Um, and an existing model from, I believe, economics is Axelrod's dissemination of culture which is a very convenient analogue to this in that it defines a person, a culture, a group based on a series of arbitrary features and traits. So for each of the five features in this case, could be any number, you have a value, what you, your version of that, your belief of that, whatever. Um, in the model these are entirely arbitrary, letters A, B, C, D, um, but you could potentially replace these with archaeological information like group one farms cows, cattle, the other group farms goats. They have different styles of pottery but they use the same type of arrowhead design. Um, the details beyond that in terms of most groups don't farm a single animal, they farm a group of animals in different proportions depending on their climate. That's all possible, that all fits into this model quite nicely. But for the moment it's important to realise that we're using arbitrary features, arbitrary traits. They don't mean anything, none of them are fitter than any other. They don't interact in, they interact in a neutral way. And the way they interact is a pair of neighbouring cultures, neighbours, may talk to each other occasionally. And they're more likely to talk if they're already similar, if they already share some values, share some features. Um, so we look at how many traits, how many features they share initially, in this case 40%, which means they have a 40% chance of interacting. If they interact, then one of the two agents will take a feature from another agent and become more similar. What this means is two things. If the two agents are completely dissimilar, they have a 0% chance of interacting, and they can't share between each other. If they're completely similar, then sharing doesn't change anything. So there's a sort of fixed state where everything's either the same or different, but there's no communication going on. That state is never realized in reality because some event always disturbs the system some new technology comes on, some new features, some catastrophe mixes people around so they're talking to different neighbours than they used to be. So all of that is a standard axle rod model and the result of it looks a little like this where you start with a very heterogeneous grid um, and here the thinner the lines, the lighter the lines, the more similar the neighbours are. Um, and as the model progresses, everyone becomes more similar, cultures grow and grow and grow, um, until there's only a few left. Um, 
what we've done is we're using this model as a base. Uh, excuse me, the lines are a bit messed up. Um, we're using this model as a base, and we're making several to see, first of all, how we can place this model within a landscape and how these modifications affect the shape of culture in that landscape and whether we can relate that to our data. The changes that help relate the model to the data are, we hope, um, factors which were important to shaping the Neolithic. Those which don't make so much difference are just the less impactful factors. Um, the first change we're making is we're replacing our square grid with a hexagonal one. This is the advantage of locally having every neighbor be an equal distance from you. So it's much more reasonable to have an equal chance of interaction with your six neighbors than it is to have with your four or your eight neighbors in a square grid. Um, and so how interaction now works is at every step in the simulation, you pick a random cell on your grid and from its six available neighbors, you pick a target, and those two agents interact as before. Um, our first further modification to that is, obviously, we want to start adding geography. We want to add details like mountains where, <coughs> never mind that, mountains where there are no people. No one lives in the mountains. Therefore, there are no culture in those mountains or in deserts or in any other inhospitable climate. Um, and it simply limits the possible interactions that you have. It eliminates some cells. Um, beyond that, we can add C into the mix. Um, and C does two things. First of all, there's no people living in the sea, but it also aids transportation. You can move much more easily in a boat longer distances um, along the coast or to a neighboring island or jumping across parts of the Mediterranean. Um, and this allows longer distance communication. It expands the local neighborhood of each cell and gives it more options. Allows cultures to spread faster, potentially. And obviously you can combine the two. Um, the colors on this slide are a little bit messed up. A lot of the yellow cells should be blue. Um, and so what effect does this have on the simulation? Where before you saw the entire grid slowly and relatively evenly get larger and more the same and eventually fixate. Uh, when you add mountains, what you see is that sort of narrow passes are much more stable places for boundary to form between cultures. So if you see the narrow pass in the sort of top, upper middle of the screen, there's a lot of the distinction between the cultures either side of that, and this lasts for a very long time, um, usually to the end of the simulation, without <coughs> those cultures interacting. So adding mountains increases the diversity, increases the separation, and mountain passes, as you would expect in reality, help to distinguish neighboring cultures. Sea has a somewhat opposite effect in that it connects larger regions. Um, in this simulation, this is over a similar time scale, but it goes on for much longer. It takes a very long time to reach any sort of stability because each neighborhood is so much larger. There's so much more option for mixing. But in the end, everything will be the same. Everything will have so much chance to talk to each other that you get very large cultures instead of smaller ones you get in a constricted landscape. If you combine these two, you start getting something similar to what you see. It's a very basic model of the Balkans. Um, and you sort of get an inland culture and a coastal culture uh, constrained by that sea corridor. Um, right, so the next modification we have is obviously the consensus at this point is that the Neolithic was largely a spread of people. It was not farmers teaching hunter gatherers to farm so much as it was farmers spreading into Europe. And at some point, we'll contrast those two options further. Um, but for the moment, um, for the moment, obviously, if you've got a spread of population, you, again, you don't have Neolithic culture to interact with where there are no Neolithic farmers. 
there's a much sparser Mesolithic culture, which I might get to later. But what we need to have is an empty space into which people can spread. Um, and we do this by adding a different sort of interaction where some cell which has some population which has neighboring empty space is able to spread to there to send a group of pioneers to go and establish a new a new settlement there. Um, and we do this over a long time. We allow cultural mixing in the meantime and we allow the population to spread. Um, and eventually, and this is very recent, still not entirely sure what the result of this is, you start getting this population spread into Europe up from the southeast. And the question we then obviously want to answer is, what effect does this shape of mountains have? What effect does the possibility of jumping over to Italy have? Um, and we don't know yet. Um, and the further plan to this is to add various other systems to this. Uh, so we've looked at the addition of mountains and sea, we've looked at the addition of population spread. We can look at the possibility of ecological feedback, whether um, whether some locations are better suited to the farming of cattle versus the farming of goats versus a lifestyle based on large and fishing. Um, whether some stone tools require resources which aren't available everywhere. Um, and we could look at the way traits interact. Perhaps certain styles of pottery are more favourable if you're farming some sort of grain or need to cook some sort of porridge. Um, and the idea is to eventually combine and compare all these different effects uh, by using a technique called approxim approximate Bayesian computation, um, which allows you to compare a lot of models to each other and a lot of models to data and see which of them have the most advantage over the other in terms of explaining the variation you see in the data. Um, so what we see so far is that actually Axelrod, the Axelrod model is a very convenient one to be using, very convenient analog to our definition of archaeological culture. Um, but it needs some initial modification, which we've largely done. Um, and there's a lot of options yet to do. Uh, I'm fairly early on to this on in this project, so this is just what's been done so far. Thank you.